today I'm going to take a look at the specimen paper for CS Double Award Science and it's the chemistry component. I'm looking at unit C1 and this is the foundation tier paper. So here we go. Okay, question one. A mixture of salt and sand may be easily separated using the following method. Add water to the mixture and stir and then filter the resulting mixture using the apparatus below. And you see here what we've got. Um, there's a beaker with some uh, water in it and some solid filter paper here, filter funnel. We've got a beaker then with the filtrate in it. We've got a stand and um, yeah, I think that's everything. So what happens to the salt and the sand when the water is added and the mixture is stirred? Well, the salt will dissolve. And that's the word they're looking for in the sand. Does not dissolve. Um, you may want, you may be tempted to say it sinks or something, but the best thing to say is it doesn't dissolve. So then B, name the pieces of apparatus A and B. So B, sorry, A is the just the retort stand, as I said, and B is the filter funnel. And in the mark scheme, you didn't even have to say retort stand. You just had to say stand and funnel was enough to get you the mark as well. So C, which two of the terms in the list below best describes substance C? And this is it here down in the beaker. So it's a solution and it's a filtrate. A residue would be a solid. Distillate is from distillation, insoluble, is something which doesn't dissolve. And solvent is just the liquid which does the dissolving on its own. Then D, explain how you would obtain a dry sample of pure salt from substance C. Well, you would simply evaporate the water off and you could say you would do that using a Bunsen burner. Number two, the periodic table is a list of all known elements. Vertical columns, cold groups contain elements which may react in a similar way. An outline of the periodic table shown below uh, shows four groups labelled A, B, C and D. So which of the groups A, B, C or D is a group of coloured non-metals? Well, that's the halogens, that is C. Which group contains the alkali metals? So you know that's group one, so that is A. Then the noble gases are a group of unreactive gases. Explain why they are unreactive. So any explanation about the noble gases, you're going to have to say they have a full outer shell of electrons. So one mark for the full outer shell and one mark for saying that that is of electrons. Part C, the metals are very, the alkali metals are very reactive. How are the alkali metals stored? You have to say something about they're stored in oil or the term we would use in chemistry is under oil. So D then, copper is a transition metal. Show the area in the periodic table above where copper is placed. So transition metal block is here in the middle. And you can see if I had shaded it previously, I'm shading it again. Okay, it's that whole block. Next part, copper forms many coloured compounds. Complete the sentences below about copper by circling the correct word. So copper 2 carbonate is a green solid. When it's heated, it decomposes to form copper 2 oxide, which is a black solid. And copper 2 oxide is a base and reacts with acids to form salts. When it reacts with, with sulfuric acid, a salt called copper sulfate is formed. The salt is blue in solution and as a solid. When the water is fully evaporated, the solid turns white and it is described as anhydrous. So just to go back to those, copper carbonate, you need to learn that, is green uh, copper sulfate would be blue, copper oxide is black. The next one is copper oxide and it is the black colour. Then copper oxide is a base that reacts with acids to form salts. So we know the salt name comes from the name of the acid. So sulfuric acid will give you a sulfate salt. Chloride would be from hydrochloric acid and nitric would, nitrate would be from nitric acid. And then copper sulfate is blue when it's hydrated. And then when it's anhydrous, it is white. So you should know that as well. That's the test for water is to <clears throat> react it with anhydrous copper sulfate. Next question is about atomic structure. So fill in the missing labels to complete the diagram. So we have these black dots around the outside on these lines. And we've got the middle here with uh, white circles, some of them with pluses in them, and it's the nucleus. So around the outside here we have electrons and then those little circles that the electrons are sitting on are the electron shells 
or you could say orbits, that would also be accepted. So one mark for each of those. And the nucleus contains two different types of particles. Name the type of particle in the nucleus with a positive charge. So protons are positive, so it's proton. Uh, what is the atomic number of this atom? So you look in here, there's three protons, one, two, three. So the atomic number is the same as the number of protons, so that is three. So to which group of the periodic table does this element belong? Uh, explain your answer in terms of its atomic structure. So this type of question, you get two marks, one for stating it and one for explaining. So it's in group one, and the reason is it has one electron in the outer shell. So you see here, this single electron on the outer shell means it is group one. Number four is about nanoparticles, and we have a big paragraph to read. Now, when you have something like this, it's tempting just to skip to the first question and ignore the whole big uh, spiel that there is. But you really need to read everything on the paper. The examiners don't put anything there without a purpose. So, nanoparticles can be used in tennis balls and golf balls. This makes tennis balls bounce higher and golf balls fly straighter. Nanoparticles are also used in the making of trousers and socks, so they last longer and are cooler in summer. Scientists think that nanoparticles have the potential to change the way we live if used in healthcare and construction materials. However, they suggest that much more work and time are needed to establish the dangers of nanoparticles before they're widely used in everyday life. So, A. What is the value of one nanometer? Tick the correct answer. It is this one. It is point. Zero 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 one nanometers. Now that's in the order of ten to the minus nine meters. So from the information provided, give the advantage of using nanoparticles in golf balls. Well, it tells you that golf balls fly straighter, straight from that paragraph. And if you've read it to begin with, you shouldn't have to go back and hook too far to actually get the answer. So then, give one use of nanoparticles in healthcare. So the obvious one we would have done in class is as a sun cream. <clears throat> but you could give other alternatives which you had covered in your course. Okay, they would also get a mark. So the, the mark scheme just said sun cream or other alternative. Number five, complete the table to show the colour of universal indicator and the pH of three solutions. So we've got lemon juice, uh, baking soda solution and cleaning fluid. So the colour of the lemon juice would be orange, that's given. And then baking soda, the mark scheme is saying dark green or blue green. And then the pH is lemon juice between 3 and 6 and the cleaning fluid between 12 and 14 for that purple colour. So from the table above, choose a solution which is a weak acid, so that's a lemon juice. And then a weak alkali would be the baking soda solution. Weak acid, of course, has to be somewhere sort of below 7 but not as low as 1 or 2 and then uh, weak alkali is above 7 but uh, not as high as 12. So uh, C then balance the symbol equation which describes the reaction between sodium oxide and hydrochloric acid. So you're given Na2O, HCl, NAC gives you NaCl and H2O. When we look at this, uh, the sodium straight away you can see is not balanced. They're two here and only one here so we put a big two in front of the NaCl and that means then that when we move so we look at the oxygen here sorry and there's one and one which is fine and then looking at this bit the HCl from adding the two in front of the NaCl here we need to add a two in front of the HCl that gives us two chlorines each side and then we have two hydrogens here and two here so that's balanced. So it's a two in front of the HCl and a two in front of the NaCl. The way that's marked, there'd be one mark for each, uh, each correct number. And acids and alkalis need to be handled with caution. In the diamond, draw the general hazard symbol you would expect to see in a bottle of acid, which needs to be handled with caution. So you're looking to draw an exclamation mark in there, as I have. Another question about nanoparticles but this time it's about graphene so it fits into that structures topic so graphene is an allotrope of carbon it consists of a single layer of carbon atoms joined by covalent bonds it's 200 times stronger than steel it conducts electricity as efficiently as copper um, and is a good conductor of heat it's almost completely transparent with the possibility of 
or possibly the highest melting point known. So I'm going to highlight what I think are important points in here. Um, and I would advise you as you're reading through a paragraph like this, underline things. So it's an allotrope of carbon, single layer of carbon atoms, covalent bonds, 200 times stronger than steel, conducts electricity and is a good conductor of heat. Um, and it's almost completely transparent with the highest melting point known. So those are important points that might come up later. So what are allotropes? Uh, you have three choices. Atoms of the same element, different mass number. Those are isotopes. Different forms of the same element with the same physical state. That is correct. And two or more atoms held tightly by a covalent bond. That's just a, a covalent molecule. So it's the middle one there. Then using the information in the passage above, label A and B in the diagram of graphene below. So it's a single layer of carbon atoms joined by covalent bonds. So here we go. Carbon atom and covalent bond. So the carbon atoms are these little spots and the covalent bonds are the lines in between. And graphene was discovered in 2004. It has many outstanding properties. Choose one property of graphene from the passage above and suggest a use based on the property. So it says any appropriate property and use. So if you pick something and given a use for it based on that property, you will get a mark. The example in the mark scheme was the property is strong, so it can be used in construction. Then explain using the information in the passage why graphene could be considered both a metal and a non-metal. What I've done here is just separated the answer into metal and non-metals. Um, so for metal, it's a good conductor of electricity and a good conductor of heat. And for a non-metal, you can say carbon is non-metallic. Um, the fact that it's transparent, you can get that for a metal, has a high melting point and it has covalent bonds. So just one point on each side there, one for metal and one for non-metal, will get you two marks. Now, what I've said here as well is not because it's an allotrope of carbon and not as a form of carbon, that's not giving you any giving any extra information, but you're going to say, but, but you said that because carbon is more non-metallic, yes, I haven't just said because it's carbon, I've said because carbon is a non-metal or carbon is non-metallic. That's the difference there. So just a note about how you answer the questions as well. You'll see that when I've been filling this in, I've had to go over the space at the bottom here. Please be very careful if you are um, writing an answer into a space uh, like this. Now, if we look at this next big question here. You'll see that it is all fit within the lines that are given here. Please don't try and write down at the bottom like this because when the... Um, exam papers are taken away by say they're scanned and anything which is outside the area uh, of the question may not be scanned so if you're running out of space put your hand up in the exam ask for an extra piece of paper and then number it carefully put all of your information on it and write the answer on the extra piece of paper because what they do is they scan those extra bits and they attach them then to the appropriate question so the examiner who's marking it will see both bits of information on their computer screen rather than just the box with the answer. So just be careful you don't go outside those boxes, please. Back to the paper. Question seven. Hot magnesium metal will burn in chlorine gas to form magnesium chloride. Complete the diagrams to show all the electrons in a magnesium atom and a chlorine atom. So magnesium, you can use your data booklet to look it up. And there are 12 electrons, so two in the first shell. Uh, then eight in the second shell and then two in the outer shell. And remember to try and group those electrons in pairs where possible. It makes it much easier to see and to mark. And then chlorine is two, eight and then seven in the outer shell. Now in part B you'll be assessed on the quality of your written communication skills including the use of specialist scientific terms. So you typically get one of these questions per paper. and uh, This is the one in the specimen paper. So explain fully in terms of electrons how the atoms of magnesium and chlorine react together to form magnesium chloride. Include in your answer the charges on the ions and an explanation of how the ions are held together in the compound. So we've got magnesium uh, is losing two electrons and it's forming a magnesium ion which is mg2 plus and you can see i've put there's one mark for talking about magnesium losing two electrons 
and one mark for the formula of the ion that it produces. And then chlorine is gaining one electron, that's another mark, and forming a chloride ion, Cl minus, that's another mark. Uh, then forms MgCl2, that's the formula, which again is worth a point. And then if you said that each magnesium needs two chlorine atoms to react with it, um, so each chlorine takes one electron, words to that effect, that's another point. And then the final part is for saying how the ions are held together in the compound. Um, so the magnesium, the Mg2+, plus, and the Cl- minus ions are held together by electrostatic attraction due to their opposite charges, and this is an ionic bond. That's going to give you uh, another point. Now, this is worth six marks, and the way these are marked, the mark scheme gives you indicative points, and each of those points I have shown here as I've done them. So to get six marks, which would be the top band, so the two bands, you get one or two marks, three or four marks, and five or six marks. So to be in that top band, to get six marks, you need to get six or seven of those points. Four or five points would put you on four marks, and one or one to three would put you on two. Now, the, the second mark in each of those brackets is dependent on your use of specialist scientific terms. So as long as you're using words like ion and electron and so on, you're going to hit that top uh, mark in each of those brackets. Next bit, using the dot and cross diagram, draw a molecule of hydrogen. So I've just drawn the two circles here. There's one hydrogen with one electron and the other hydrogen. With the other electron, a little overlap. It uh, doesn't really matter where you draw those electrons in the overlap as long as each hydrogen has one associated with it. And I write the H in the centre so that you know what the atoms are. That's more useful if it's something like, you know, compound like water or ammonia or something like that. It helps the examiner see what you're doing. Then name the following, the bond between hydrogen atoms in a molecule of hydrogen, well it's covalent. And then the force between neighbouring hydrogen molecules is of course van der Waals. The final question then, number eight, it's about relative atomic mass, relative formula masses and using mole calculations. So what do you understand by the relative atomic mass of an element? So three marks for this, so you're having to say three things. And the first thing is it's the average mass of an atom, of an element then compared with that of a carbon-12 isotope, which has a mass of exactly 12. Then the calculations. Calculate the relative formula mass of each of the following substances. So you've got the uh, atomic masses are given there, so it's just a matter of adding them all up. So we've got sodium sulfate, Na2SO4, so we've got two sodiums, two 23s, sulfur is 32, and four oxygens, four 16s. So that's 46 plus 32 plus 64, which is 142. Then the aluminium hydroxide. So we've got one aluminium, uh, Al, and then OH3. So I've taken that just as a group. So OH, one oxygen, one hydrogen, 16 plus one is 17. And I've multiplied by that, that by three. So 27 and 51 then, and is 78. Then it says silver nitrate, IgNO3, has a relative formula mass of 170. How many moles of silver nitrate are there in 340 grams of a substance? So the number of moles is the mass divided by the formula mass. The mass is 340. The formula mass is 170. So the answer there is 2. So 2 moles. Then what's the mass of 0.3 moles of silver nitrate? So rearranging this formula, the moles is the mass divided by the formula mass. Take the mass, then is the term we want, it's the moles times the, for, the formula mass. So 0.3 from the question times 170 from the previous question is 51 grams. So 